Coming up on Tech News Today, Google offers Renochrome. AT&T logic means less competition is lower prices. And is TwitPic really stealing your photos? All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, May 11th, 2011. Tech News Today is brought to you by Slingbox, which just turned your iPad into a television. Look, Slingbox introduces their new iPad app, so you can now watch your home TV on your iPad anywhere you take it. Check it out at Best Buy or slingbox.com slash twit. And by Trim Tonic, a natural appetite suppressant tonic that makes the edge off your being hungry. Visit trimtonic.com for more information and enter coupon code twit for a 20% discount. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. Happy to be joined today by Joanna Stern from ThisIsMyNext.com. Hey, Joanna. Hey, guys. How's it going out there? It's it's going. I'm I'm a little stuffed up from allergies, so you'll we, have to bear with me. You know, we all are. We're right hazy. there. We're right there with you. Uh, but you've been yeah. following the Google I/O stuff from out there. You're in New York, right? I'm in New York. Yeah, didn't come out for Google I/O, but been watching all the live sessions and. Uh, the keynotes and definitely been following the news this week. You kind of don't need to be at Google I.O. unless you're just wanting to be in and amongst the crowds and get free things. Yeah, you definitely need to be there for free things. Yeah. I was about to say that. Well, I if mean, you're a developer, then you can meet other folks right. and they've got after parties and it's a whole social event, too. But if you just want to know what happens. Then you can watch the live stream. They've got great live coverage. <laughs> or read all the coverage. Yeah. yeah. Right. Or listen to us. Yeah. Uh, we're going to tell you what happened. Today was the Chrome announcement, uh, and frankly, uh, not nearly as as packed full of, of, of stuff as the Android announcement was yesterday. Uh, they did some demos of Chrome, but it was all stuff we already knew existed, like speech demo and graphics acceleration. Uh, they talked about the Chrome Web Store, but really the only big news is that developers uh, can now do in-app payments and are charged a flat fee of 5%. Right. So if you want, yeah. if you want to, if you're, you know, want to do in-app payments, ninety-five percent of the money stays with you. Uh, I guess the bigger, maybe bigger news was Angry Birds is coming to the Chrome Web Store. I've had. Enough. I was going to say Angry Birds sort of stole that first part of the keynote there, huh? And I'm not sure that's necessarily a good thing. They went over by eight minutes, and I feel like that oh, eight really? minutes was Angry Birds. I'm I'm so over <laughs> Angry Birds being thrown in as, and this is why we're the best. And Angry like, Birds. It like legitimizes every app store, though. It's it's like, does the a... Nook have an app store? Yes. Does it have Angry Birds? Yes. So now it's actually worthwhile. The web store, does it have one? Yes. But now it, I'm going to use it. Does it have a special edition of one? I bet it does. I bet it has a special level and a special bird or pig. Well, the, yeah. Chrome, the right. Chrome. And that's the new thing, right? Yeah. Does it have a special level or a special uh, little pig or whatever it is? So, the, the Chrome version no, that, of Angry Birds it, it it comes with exclusive levels only available in Chrome. Well, okay. So it's a, a different And, and the they have like little Chrome bombs. Oh, yes. gosh. See, I Chrome feel like he was really, he was really like, excited about that, the guy in the... A little uh, overexcited. I forget something like copy and paste he had a great, would great be accent, too. Something that everyone can be proud to say. And we've got this, too. And ours is better. But and, and you Birds? can do in-app purchases of the Mighty Eagle if you get stuck on a level. <laughs> The mighty, right, the mighty ego. Uh, and new WebGL for Chrome. Uh, so they were showing that off as well. Uh, Chrome OS had the bulk of the announcements. New file manager coming to Chrome OS this summer. New media player. Offline access for Gmail, Calendar, and Docs. Uh, but the biggest news was, of course, the devices. Uh, they're going, there's going to be a Samsung Acer uh, new Chromebook available June 15th online. You can order it from Amazon and Best Buy. And uh, the Samsung 12.1 inch display, all day battery, Wi Fi, and 3G options. Uh, two colors. They didn't say which two colors, though. Black oh, and maybe uh, white. It's a white and black. Yeah. Is it? Okay. If you look at the, uh, at least the Samsung um, Chromebook on Amazon, it has white and black. And neither one is images. Chrome. They're just silver. They're just black or white. Right. How, could, how did they miss that opportunity? To put a little chrome on Yeah, a little chrome Too on a Chromebook. Too obvious. Is the band Chicago from Chicago? I have yes. no idea. Yes. Oh. All right. Well, then they missed an opportunity. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, so the Sam, the Samsung with Wi-Fi only uh, will be $429 if you want the 3G uh, capability built in, $499. And then Acer has a little bit of a smaller one, 11.6-inch screen, Wi-Fi and 3G starting at $349, I assume, for the Wi-Fi only. What do you guys think of these? Uh, you're you're going to be able to get them in the U.S. June 15th, and then they're going to roll out to six more countries, France, U.K., Netherlands, Spain, Germany, and Italy. Um well, you know, my first reaction is, huh, you can get a netbook-like device for under these prices. They're not undercutting anybody. Uh, you know, Microsoft netbooks, for example. But Microsoft doesn't have this neat monthly pricing rate mm -hmm. that I've never heard of before. Um, if you're a school or a business, or I suppose if you're a one-person business, if I can prove that I, I run some sort of my own business, I could get a pricing model where I pay... Uh, 28 bucks a month for full coverage, meaning hardware and software upgrades for a lifetime of my account, meaning right. and $20 for students. That's amazing. Now, yeah. I think the $28 is a good deal for business and the $20 might end up being a little too expensive for, for educational institutions. Uh, you mean because mm -hmm. you would assume that this would be the kind of setup where every kid in a classroom of 20 would have their own Chromebook? Yeah, I mean, when you consider, if I'm, if I'm going to outfit, you know, I guess if I'm only going to get three or four of them, then that, that, that makes it a different story. But if I want to outfit laptops for the school, mm -hmm. uh, right. and, and I'm going to buy 160 laptops for, for a large school system, that's going to be $36,000 a year. That's a big line item yeah, for, for right. a school district. Even, and it, so and is that how you, this is done? So these, and it's all seems to be done at the institutional like level that these are actually paid for there, and that they wouldn't ask the students to pay. No, I mean, I I, I assume a student could buy it individually too, uh, right? If, if they wanted the, to. That was yeah. all a little hazy, and you know, we didn't have a, a real chance to ask questions about that. That's the other um, thing is, I wonder on the business side, can I buy one? And right. just say, I'm a business and I'd like to rent one for 28 bucks a month because I might do that. Well, I mean, right. that, that was my question is, I mean, on my taxes, I have an independent business, you know, that I'm, I'm forced to claim. So it's like, sure, why not? You I'm mean you have a business. real business that incurs expenses that you can therefore legally deduct on your taxes. Right. Right. She owns an LLC or something. Yeah. Something like we that. We all just work for her actually on the side. I, IRS. I have a blog, okay? She has a real business. That's a business. <laughs> That's right. I have the same setup. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, in terms of the pricing, it was really interesting because I, you know, I've been thinking about this over the past week, like, where do these really have to hit right now? And actually on Monday, HP announced a Win Windows 7 laptop uh, netbook, basically similar prices for $299. And it's a really nice netbook, you know, nice display. They've got now Beats Audio in it and all this sort of thing. And, and two years ago, a netbook like that was like, really about what these prices are that we're hearing today, 350, 450, around that. So, you know, in terms of just going toe to toe with actual netbooks out there, this is this is sort of outlandish, the pricing that we're hearing. But these other pricing models are really interesting, in my opinion. And if you think about sort of, let's say you keep this for a year and a half, two years, you pay the $28 a month or the $20 a month, you're looking for, you know, how long you usually keep it? Two years. It's like about four hundred and eighty dollars over, you know, a two-year period, which comes out to about what you would pay for these these as standalone devices. And it seems like you're getting a pretty good deal in terms of software and services, and also you're getting three G built into that package. And you get a hardware upgrade. I mean, that's the key. Right. Is and over, a hardware upgrade. Exactly. Is they're probably going to come out with exactly. a new model every year, which means over that two years, you get an upgrade. Yeah, but with a subscription right. model with Google, right? Are they really known for customer service? So if something goes wrong with my laptop, am I going to be able to contact that's them? That's my biggest. Or do I have to go to yeah. a forum and get lost in that thing, and then maybe they'll get back to me, assuming my laptop is online, which it probably isn't, if I have a problem with my Chromebook. I mean, I right. mean uh, they're, they're not really they, great for that kind of thing. And they said something about support today. And that would have been another question I had today was like, what is the support here? And if there's a problem with this, is it you're, that you're dealing with Google? Are you dealing with Samsung? Are you dealing with Acer? Um, you know, did they have the infrastructure to then, you know, have the support? I mean, if there's a problem with your Windows laptop, uh, you know, you can either get the support through Microsoft or you can get it through the company you bought it from. So... That's definitely been a major question in this sort of realm. You know, the CR48, it was like you know, the people are, are the support. Yeah, yeah and it, it, they weren't clear about, I mean, when we're talking about it, it's like hardware upgrades, awesome. So like 
a right. whole new unit because what else are they going to swap out? But what designates you being ready for a new unit? You know, if you drop it in a pool of water, is somebody going to check it out and say, no, this is your fault because Apple does that right. sometimes. This right. is not deserving of an upgrade kind of thing. It could get dicey. And that's where customer service would have to be really good at, at that point or people are just going to be frustrated. They also made the point that because Chrome doesn't have drivers and, and installations and it's all cloud-based, that it actually gets better as time goes on because they're constantly updating the software and fine-tuning it, which means... If that were true, the hardware upgrade part of it is less compelling. Do they not know that people eat over their laptops at their desks at work every day? Sometimes salty chips that fall into things. I mean, I, I get what you're saying, but it's like the hardware itself, especially if you're talking about a school. I mean, I don't, right. I don't think yeah. they're going to get more polished after a couple of years. Well, and, and so there, <laughs> for the school, I think it's a really interesting question. I think for businesses, this is really compelling. $28, uh, easy support. I've already got IT department mm -hmm. built in. Schools usually got a strapped IT department. Uh, $36,000 for 160 students. You know, I, I took that number from somebody on Twitter who, who runs a, uh, a university IT department and said, that's how much it's going to cost me. That's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, granted, the benefit is I've got support available built into that money, and I've got uh, a hardware upgrade in a year, mm -hmm. theoretically. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I could spend $300 or less for laptops that are out right now, and... Yeah, I'd have to service them myself, but when when the you know school budget gets cut, I don't lose the laptops because I already paid for them. Whereas with the Google Chromebooks, budget gets cut, all of a sudden you have to cut back that thirty six thousand dollars. You have to give back some laptops because you're not you're not renting them anymore. Yeah, that's very true. Do we know anything about the time commitments? Do you are you required to have a one year commitment to this twenty dollars subscription thing, or or is this a month to month kind of situation? They didn't say. I, they didn't say anything about contract terms so i'm assuming it's month to month but but that's just a guess i don't ha i don't have a uh, confirmation on that uh, a few other things to to cover from from google io today netflix and hulu support coming uh yeah. for for chrome os which uh, that's kind of like the angry birds thing you got to say yeah we can we can support Us too. we can support right. this Us well, that too. means hulu didn't single them out as a new thing it's not a tablet which they right. ask for extra money it's a laptop so the form factor in the os actually made a difference in this because if it was an android powered thing you got to have some kind of Hulu Plus. There's also a Chrome Box in development, which is a mini desktop, same as the the Chromebook. It's just not a laptop, which I, that could be useful as a uh, media center since Hulu isn't blocked. Yeah, that was actually right. that was my my first reaction was yeah Hulu and uh, Netflix on on a uh, Chromebook okay but can I can I send it to my TV in my living room where I really want to watch it? But that means if you had an Android powered Google TV, you couldn't stream Hulu out unless you paid for it. But if you had the Chrome Box, you could do it for free. So that's just <laughs> very odd. You're beating up on Android here. Well, um, one more Hulu than Android. Yeah, Hulu. No, I mean, it's, it's a definitely a valid complaint. Google also announced it's expanding the number of countries where Android customers can buy apps via the market to 131 countries, up from 32. Uh, they're going to give developers one-click access to set up an advertising campaign, uh, and they're, they're going to do some other tweaks to the marketplace to make it easier to sell. And then late this afternoon, uh, they showed off Google TV uh, with the new Honeycomb UI. So once Google TV does get Honeycomb, which is supposed to happen later this summer, as well as apps, it's going to look a little different. It's going to look more like a tablet interface than that current sort of left side nav blade interface that it's got. I think it looks better. Uh, I do too. Uh, I think it, it's more intuitive. Um, and obviously Google is making an effort to try to bring together um, what what people have accused it of being too fragmented on in the past. So, works for me. I'm I'm excited. Any any um, improvements to Google TV makes me happy. Yeah, I think it was interesting. Like that, this basically wasn't discussed at any of the keynotes yesterday morning. They talked about uh, what you're mentioning here, Tom, which is that this is going to come, but they didn't really talk about like how this is going to scale for the TVs, what the sort of app situation is going to be. And then this screenshot just leaked out today at some sort of developer meeting uh, that was happening this afternoon. So it was sort of like they clearly are still working on what's going on here. I mean, I'm hoping they're they're getting everything ready and and just. Uh, really sort of taking it out of beta, but it just seems sort of like pushed to the side. Yeah, they they made kind of a big splash by throwing it into the Android announcement and then didn't really back it up with any details. They have announced that they are open sourcing the code to the Google TV remote app for Android. 
So uh, if anybody wants to take a crack at making a better remote app, uh, that code's downloadable uh, from, from Google Code now. So anyway, lots of, lots of interesting stuff happening at Google I.O., and we will have we actually have some more Google stuff later in the show that's not related to Google I.O. It's kind of a Google heavy day. But thank goodness AT&T and T-Mobile were in Washington, D.C. to give us a break from Google News. AT&T was, it was there. so nice of them. Yeah, I know. Wasn't it considerate? AT&T. It was really nice of AT&T to want to buy T-Mobile and have this. Just so we can have a diversion. Yeah. The, uh, Al Franken and friends set up a Senate antitrust committee hearing called the AT&T T-Mobile merger colon is Humpty Dumpty being put back together again. Uh, and they grilled AT&T head, T-Mobile's head, Dan Hesse from Sprint, several rural network players, and uh, a lot, lot of other expert testimony. The, the three uh, concerns that were brought up by Sprint as well as the rural carriers was that one, AT&T and Verizon could lock up handsets because between the two of them, they could, they could do enough exclusives that none of the good smartphones would be coming to Sprint or the rural carriers. Mm -hmm. uh, two, data roaming could be even harder to get. Sometimes AT&T refuses to do data roaming agreements with rural carriers. Rural carriers rely on these roaming agreements to provide nationwide coverage. Uh, and if AT&T has even less competition, they're less likely to want to do data roaming, and there's l one less option for rural carriers to make a partnership. And finally, Sprint especially uh, was concerned with special access issues. Every tower that Sprint puts up, they say they pay 30% of the cost of that tower to either AT&T or Verizon for landline backhaul. And if AT&T has you know, eliminated one more competitor then there, there's even more motivation for them to raise that price. Sprint says, look, if we didn't have to pay all this, if we had to pay reasonable amounts for landline backhaul to our towers, we could lower prices and, and really put pressure on this. It's funny. On the flip side, of course, AT&T and T-Mobile, their argument is, well, we're not actually really competitors. In fact, T-Mobile is sort of forced into saying, our network isn't very strong. Uh, we'd benefit so much from being part of the AT&T uh, we're, family. We're hardly even a carrier. <laughs> Which is funny because uh, we suck. one of the senators yeah, that's basically who's what been, they're saying. Uh, Senator Herb Cole, who's a um, Democrat from Wisconsin, was like, wait a second. You two are competitors. You, you have to understand that you're competitors. I mean, we just talked about T-Mobile um, soon rolling out a really good service where we're going to be able to... Um, up onto Wi-Fi and not get uh, and be able to talk on the phone without having minutes taken off of our uh, 3G service. No free, extra charge. Free yeah. Wi-Fi calling. I mean, yeah, it, I mean it's like that's calling. that's what competition is. Hey, we're offering a service that you can't get with that other guy. So come uh, join us. That's exactly what competition. And is. the hearing keeps throwing around the word duopoly and like there's Sprint sitting there. Dan Dan Hesse, the head of Sprint's like, well, you know, we also are a company. We we, we um, would still right. be here. We're afterwards. a third company. Um, so it's not well, necessarily no, I mean, that, that was actually the most interesting thing, I think, out of the hearings today was sort of seeing Hesse talk and sort of, I think, for the first time say, you know, well, we could be acquired by Verizon and sort of the discussion that was going on with that and then hearing him being grilled on, well, you could still make it if these the if this were acquisition were to go through. Um, so I think that was the first time that he had said that publicly. I mean, of course, Sprint has been uh, pretty adamant against this. I mean, there was some huge ads this weekend in, in the papers just sort of talking about how, you know, this is America and sort of there needs to be competition. But um, I think that was actually a pretty interesting finding out of today's hearing. AT&T's arguments basically boiled down to if we buy T-Mobile, our network gets better and that's good for everybody. Mm -hmm. And if we have uh, fewer carriers competing for Spectrum, that could magically drive down prices. Well, their service could get better. I know this joke's been done before. If they put the $39 billion into infrastructure, instead of buying their competition. Yeah, right. Uh, we've, we've got an email to that effect regarding DSL later, later on in the show. But I, did Joanna, did you follow that at all, the, that, that argument that somehow if, if Spectrum isn't split up amongst so many people that they could charge less for it? Are they arguing the, an economy of scale? The, this was the, the argument with, uh, with LTE Spectrum? Yeah, they were saying, look, if we get the Spectrum from T-Mobile... Uh, then it's not split up in, in, amongst four carriers. It's split, split up amongst right. three, and then that will actually be able to charge less. Right. I don't think they will. I mean, I don't think they will charge less. Well, I mean, T-Mobile is saying, listen, we don't have sufficient, sufficient spectrum to roll out an LTE network. 
AT&T would make it possible for us to do that since we have to support existing HSPA, GSM. So they're kind of like, listen, we're just too small. We can't survive otherwise. This is the only way not to kill us completely. Yeah. We have to merge with AT&T. Obviously, not everybody agrees. All right, let's take a uh, quick break. When we come back, uh, we'll update you on the PlayStation Network as well as a new net censorship bill and the TwitPic controversy. I want to thank Slingbox for helping to bring us tech news today. Uh, Slingbox introduces their new iPad app. It's been a while for it's been out for just a couple months now and allows you to watch your home TV on your iPad anywhere you take it. Turns your iPad into a television. Extra television in your kitchen, out in the shed out back, in the garage. Uh, watch or not even on your property at all. Exactly. In if another you're, if state. you're traveling. Uh, anywhere you have an internet connection, you can watch your home TV without paying any extra fees, any extra subscriptions. All the stuff you get at home, including what's on your DVR, available on your iPad, on your smartphone, on your computer. You can find Slingbox or see a demo at Best Buy or check it out at slingbox.com slash twit. Slingbox and your home TV now appearing on iPads everywhere. Ooh, ooh, ooh. All right, just a quick check-in. Uh, the <laughs> PlayStation Network is still down yes we can confirm is it down for everyone or just me it is down for all mankind <laughs> okay i just wanted to make sure according to is the psn down.com okay uh this is actually the uh anniversary of the playstation network site. going down should have a cake yeah 14 days it's been 14 days oh, exactly two, two weeks, weeks. Yeah. two weeks and going strong everybody the outage is two weeks old it's oh. just i just always keep thinking the story is going to keep getting worse it's they, not going to get better no you know what's funny is with with all the IO news yesterday, it was probably the first time in two weeks that we yeah. hadn't talked about PSN on TNT. And we couldn't leave them feeling even neglected. Even in passing, yeah. we didn't even mention them. Wow, it's just yeah. yeah. It, what do you what do you say? It's just it, it sucks. It's just a shame. I just I keep thinking like it's like anytime there's some bad news that comes out of this Sony debacle, I'm just like, you know, I sort of expected it. It's sad. A uh, new net censorship bill has been revised out of the old COICA, uh, the Combating Online Infringement uh, Act. Now we have the Protect IP Act, which What's stands for Preventing Real Online Threats to Economic Creativity and Theft of Intellectual Property Act. Uh, it does provide a more limited definition of sites dedicated to infringing to activity in act or activities. Uh, there was worry under COICA that it could be applied to YouTube or, or pretty much anybody who put content up since it potentially could infringe could th therefore be taken down. But while they've limited the definition a little, they've expanded who should be responsible for enforcing it. Copyright and trademark holders don't even have to go to the government to target new sites under the bill. They are allowed to seek court orders directly, uh, though these orders would only apply to payment processors and advertising networks. But you wouldn't even have to involve the government. You'd go to court get an order, and then go to Visa and go to iAds and say, you have to stop serving that site. I've got a court order. Hmm. And nobody and no due process. Uh, the bill summary makes clear that ad networks and payment processors will be protected if they voluntarily cease doing business with infringing websites outside of any court-ordered action. So if you say, you know what, I thought they were infringing. I didn't like them. I just wanted to cut them off. Uh, that's, that's in there, too. And it will force uh, credit card companies, not only credit card companies, but search engines as well uh, as ISPs to play along with this. So thankfully, uh, we can take the business of law enforcement away from the courts and the law enforcement agencies and put it where it properly belongs in the hands of private enterprise. Yeah, oh, yeah, because uh, nobody people. has an agenda. I, I mean, there, there would <laughs> nobody would try to get anybody taken down unless they had a really good reason, right? I no, asked. I can't see any. So any this is a good win for the man, is yeah. what we're hearing. I wouldn't panic just yet. It's still a bill. Okay, it's not like it's a law yet. Right. Um, so we can panic later, is what I'm saying. Although I, I will say, uh, we should points, panic now. <laughs> points you know, points to change in the now. What are we gonna do? It might become a law. That okay. is how Would it you works. like to panic now and say this was going to happen? I'm just saying. If you don't panic now, I'm just saying the, house you want to wait got, to panic until it becomes a law? I don't think it's going to become a law because if the first one got, didn't get through, this one won't get through either. You know why the first one didn't get through? Because we talked about it. Because people panicked. Well, this one, again, has a better name. Okay, The other one, people were joking around in the, in the uh, legal circles. They called it cloaca. Okay, because that's what it looked like when you look at the word. Now it's protect IP. Don't you want to protect IP, Tom? Don't you want to make sure that this show isn't pirated? No, but, actually, but, I want people it, to spare the show around. Up, <laughs> we could shut the show down. Yeah. 
the first bill didn't uh, become law, but this is almost more vague. So mm -hmm. isn't that scarier? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is scarier. So hopefully because there was backlash on that first one, this second one, hopefully because of how broad it is, it shouldn't go through either. Panic now. Yeah, we need to panic. Panic before it's too late. There's There's a panic, panic button. button. <laughs> All right. Uh, something ah. people have, have been panicking about one. is TwitPic. I need one, though. Uh, a lot of folks out there are saying that TwitPic changed their terms of service to say that they own your photos and can sell them and make money. That is not, in fact, what is going on. Right. Uh, TwitPic did change their terms of service uh, and then changed them again to clarify that they retain the right uh, to trans retransmit and use the photos on TwitPic Anywhere in the universe, you know, any way they want. It's essentially boilerplate terms of service that you will find on almost every online service. Not every online service, but go look at Facebook. Uh, go look at TwitLonger. Go look at lots of services. Mm -hmm. uh, go look at your favorite forum. They all say this to protect themselves in being able to use your postings in their promotional opportunities, if they wanted to make TV commercials, if they want to make ads that show a screenshot of the site that you can't come back and say... I, re I removed the license for you to use my posting. Now you owe me money. Mm -hmm. um, what has got TwitPic in extra hot water is they have contracted a company called WEN, the Worldwide Entertainment News Network, to protect celebrity photos. And that's where the confusion comes from, I believe. Uh, celebrities who take photos and post them on TwitPic often complain that others then take their pictures and use them in news articles, use them on blog postings without their permission. So what TwitPic has done is contracted when to sell rights to the pictures. So if I'm Conan O'Brien and I use TwitPic to post a photo, no one's supposed to be able to use that photo unless they go to when and pay money for that. Exactly. What people are reacting right. is as if when they say celebrity photos, they mean if I take a picture of Conan O'Brien and use TwitPic, that TwitPic can then go sell it and make money without me. And I don't think that's what they mean. No, I mean, this. what, they're, what, what right. they mean is that uh, more and more celebrities or people in the public eye, for whatever reason, are using tools like Twitter. TwitPic is one of the, if not often, the default uh, picture ser hosting service that, um, I mean, there's TwitPic and there's YFrog and, and there are a few others. Um, but it's popular enough so that people are now saying, well, wait a second, I want to participate in this whole social media thing, but I want to have control of my own images. It's not about taking a picture of Conan O'Brien walking down Hollywood Boulevard and that somehow being illegal to then upload to your own TwitPic account. What, what TwitPic right. isn't doing is giving you the chance to say, hey, I want to take part in this easily because they should be protecting everybody's photos, whether you're a celebrity or not. Right. And, and, and unfortunately, they're not because WEN has relationships with celebrities already. So you have to have some kind of relationship with, with WENN for this to work. But it's causing all kinds of confusion because it's only protecting people who have a relationship with WENN. Well, and I suspect that this has a lot to do with other picture services that have, have, have already uh, put these, these ideas into place. We talked about this on the social hour a few days ago. There's a there's a, 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 a hosting service called Huse, which is actually a company from within CAA, which is Creative Artist Agency, which right, is- Right, you were mentioning big, this before. Yeah, it's a big agency in LA. It's one of the biggest ones. And you'll notice that a lot of celebrities um, send picture links on Twitter that have a certain string. It's like S-A-Y dot L-Y. And that's Huse because the whole point is CAA saying, well, listen, we want, artists right. to be able to share photos and and you know get their fans all excited about their next movie but we want to retain the rights to right. these pictures and we want to be there able to sue people who take them and run them in a magazine or something like that yeah i don't know i don't follow that many celebrities but do they i mean i, I follow demi Moore and maybe ashton kutcher but <laughs> other than other i mean are there a lot of people uh, of these celebrities tweeting pictures is this like yeah it's, well, are, it's, are they really great and they could use them like uh, it's growing I, mean, I would assume you're right you're saying it's like in the sets and that sort of thing it's growing uh when i i have a friend actually who works at who say um and she she had told me their business model some time ago and i was like yeah i mean so tom hanks i i mean how many people is this really going to apply to and i'm actually seeing more and more celebrities using uh these particular services so I mean, it's all a matter of retaining rights to stuff that they think other right. people are going to get money off of. Well, what TwitPic yeah. is trying to do is keep the celebrities using Gaga TwitPic. Yeah, they need some pictures. TwitPic wants to stop 
exactly. uh, celebrities from going and using something like Huse. They yeah. want to keep using TwitPix, so they made mm-hmm. this deal. But it's confusing the hell out of everybody. And so now Moby Picture has done something very smart. They stepped up and said, hey, our terms of service, all rights of uploaded content by our users remain the property of our users and can in no means be sold or used by Moby Picture. Done. Yeah, so what if, if it's a picture of Moby? <laughs> If Different Moby that. uploaded it, then Moby owns yeah. it. And if Moby didn't upload it, then he has a uh, right of celebrity image that I don't even want to go into. Well, but. that's also Moby Pick being like, hey, if, if a celebrity gets mad about something, you sue that user. It's their picture. We don't right. retain rights to anything. So anyway, if you're worried about this, if you're still skeptical saying, I don't trust TwitPick, Moby picture, maybe. Yeah, check maybe, them out. Who knows? Maybe that's for you. All I'm going right. to take a picture of one of the other TwitPicks and see if... If that gets me anywhere. Ooh. How mad, yeah. Inception. How many yeah. levels do yeah. can you go before yeah, you're safe? Yeah, exactly. And then I'm going to exactly. take a picture of Joanna's picture. Right. <laughs> Problem is, you'll never and wake up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, let's uh, finish up with a couple of discussion stories. New York Times numbers are out for after their first month with the paywall up. Comscore data shows that New York Times' share of newspaper website traffic was 10.6% last month down from 13% in March. So actually not down that much as a share of newspaper sites. However, uh, the site's overall page views plunged 24%, while unique visitors were off 13%. New York Times says that it was a slow news month in April, and that's why the page views were down. The fact that their share of newspaper website traffic didn't fall that month kind of says that might be true. Now, these numbers are interesting, but I, I mean, the numbers that we don't have, like... How are how is their revenue doing since they've done this pay, paywall? Do they actually have a system where they're making a lot more money? Can they command advertisers the way they want to? Can they command the rates they want? Because this is that's the real experiment. Whether the numbers go up or down, I mean, we're pretty sure. I'm pretty sure next month we're going to be saying, hey, after that Bin Laden thing, they had a lot of traffic because that's what everyone was checking out. But the but the key will be, do, does that traffic go up as a share? Uh, as much as it went down as a share mm-hmm. and, and recover it. And, and really, you, you hit the, the nail on the head. It's whether they make money or not. Uh, finally, Greg Zandoval over at CNET has talked to multiple sources who say the music industry is now po- pinning their hopes on Apple, <laughs> of all things. Uh, neither Google nor Amazon could deliver the same range of options that Apple will be able to offer with its upcoming cloud service, say the sources. The hope in the music industry is that Apple's music service will make the competing offerings look shabby by comparison and force Amazon and Google to pay the licensing rates the labels are asking. Uh, Lots of people at the four major labels now hope the service will launch at Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference on June 7th. Joanna, this is kind of funny considering uh, for the last couple of years, the music industry has been saying Apple's the one that's ruining our industry. Exactly. That was my reaction to this is like all these labels and these, uh, you know, they've been hating on Apple for years and, uh, you know, sort of Apple got us into this mess and now they're they're waiting on them. Apple's the, uh, the, the golden, you know, the ray of hope here. So I think it's really interesting. I'm, I'm really definitely looking forward to seeing what Apple brings out in, uh, in, at, at, at WWDC. We were talking about this at, this is my next the other day, just talking about sort of the offerings that there is in the, in the cloud music service and, uh, or in the industry and that like sort of, you know, Apple has really been missing and uh, it's just time for it, for them to step in. And then, you know, a lot of disappointing reaction yesterday to Google music and, Right. Uh, you know, we know it's in, in beta. I haven't actually gotten my invite yet. I don't know if you guys have, but a lot of disappointing reaction to it. So. No, I haven't gotten my invite yet. Neither have I. No. We had to be we, at I.O. apparently. We should have gone so. to I.O., guys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, won't make that mistake next year. Uh, they, yeah. Uh, the, so the big thing with Google Music is is that it doesn't have a store built in yet. Mm-hmm. yet. Right. Google's still hoping that they right. can get a deal for it. But. With uh, Amazon, you do have a store, and when you buy a, a, a piece of music from Amazon, it goes into your cloud storage automatically. It doesn't count against your limit. What mm-hmm. could Apple offer that would be an improvement on that? What are these big things that they can risk doing as if they have industry approval? Well, iTunes has done things like iTunes LPs. They've tried to do things to make mm-hmm. it more of an album experience again, trying to make it like liner notes kind of stuff. I mean, digital booklets come with these things, music videos. So maybe they would provide a I guess it'd be, first it'd be a style over substance kind of thing because Amazon does have effectively the same stuff. But Apple's got a great way of marketing things. You know, This is the easiest exactly. way to do it. It's in it's iTunes. Apple. Exactly. You got Steve Jobs <laughs> up there saying it, people will believe that. Right. You got I mean, Jeff I think Bezos. a lot of us also are holding out, or we have for many years, about some sort of subscription service. I mean, mm-hmm. again, whatever it is, uh, it's Apple, and they've obviously got you know the label support and sort of the partnerships. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, I've become a huge fan of RDO in the past few weeks. And, uh, you know, I, I literally, uh, I haven't opened iTunes in the past, like, probably uh, literally in the past few weeks. So they definitely really need to catch up into that cloud space. All right, let's move on to the news views. Now, we're pretty certain you noticed this when you were reading Google's SEC filing, but in case you zoned out or fell asleep, Google might have to pay the Department of Justice $500 million. Why? Google is quite vague in the filing, saying that the $500 million penalty is, quote, in connection with a potential resolution of an investigation by the United States Department of Justice into the use of Google advertising by certain advertisers. So there you go. Hush money. <laughs> iOS app iFlow Reader is being shut down by its developer. Oh, man. Well, wait. I haven't actually ever heard of iFlow Reader before. If you're unfamiliar like I am, it sells books via its app, or it did anyway because the developers are blaming Apple for the app's demise because the profit margins on the book were low, and with Apple's cut, books were actually being sold at a loss. The iFlow Reader site has rather scathing explanation with such gems like we put our faith in apple and they screwed us and they are the first company to feel that way jilted love <laughs> according to one ios developer apple is not displaying ads from its iads network on games geared towards children apple has told the developer that it, po it positions the ads in apps that reflect the advertiser's target market so yeah, some kind of pokemon like game or something yep. yeah Meredith Atwell Baker, one of the two Republican commissioners at the Federal Communications Commission, plans to step down from her job on the regulatory agency. But don't worry about her. She's going to be okay. Four months after arguing hard against any restrictions on the Comcast NBC deal, Baker has a job offer to work for NBC Universal as a lobbyist. Seems like a good fit. You know, uh, we've we've been talking about a lot of really interesting stories today, but you know who we haven't talked about much lately? Uh, I don't hmm. know. Who Google. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, not much is going on uh, except in Belg uh, Belgium. A Belgian appeals court actually upheld a decision that says Google can't link to or copy sections of Belgian newspapers because doing so is a copyright infringement. So let that sink in. If Google fails to comply, they'll be slapped with a 25,000 euro fine per day unless they remove links and copies. And if they do comply, then Belgium pretty much shuts down the internet as Belgian people know it, at least right now. Yeah, I'm sure no one link, will care. They don't exist, right? Eh. Stop saying that dirty word, Belgian. Starting on Google. Monday. <laughs> Google. Starting on Stop saying that word, Google. <laughs> I don't think that word means what you think it means. What is this Google? <laughs> No idea. Starting on Monday, the Navy will host one of the least likely online games ever. M-M-O-W-G-L-I. It's massive multiplayer online war game leveraging the internet. Mowgli. Oh. Yes, everyone knew that, right? Uh, which it's been building since 2009. The game is about counter piracy of the Somali, not BitTorrent piracy. The game encourages players to offer about their best suggestions for clearing the seas of the resurgent maritime scourge. Why do they have to use the word leveraging in something that's supposed to be fun? Because they, they wanted to make it Mowgli after the Jungle Book <laughs> character. Okay. So they needed an L. All right. Going with Mogwai. Uh, do you know about Google? Uh, no. Mm. Do you know what they do? They're a pioneer of self-driving cars. Oh, you yeah. You may have yeah, heard yeah. of that. Oh, um, yeah. They've been quietly lobbying for legislation that would make Nevada the first state where self-driving cars could legally operate on public roads. The legislation would also give operators an exemption from the ban on sending text messages while in the driver's seat. Gosh, Google, if they pull something like this off, they could... Put them on the map. They could really be a viable company. Yeah. Yeah. Dot Weekly is reporting that T-Mobile's been totally bogarting the word Snapchat, if you know what I mean. Buying up a host of domains and filing a trademark all within the span of just two days. And that was last week. Obviously, this indicates maybe a possible tablet with a Snapdragon processor or somehow, oh, I don't know, integrating Snap Peas into roaming service. It could be anything, really. I'm going to go with Snapdragon. I think Snap Peas, probably. Yeah. Snap Peas is good. Why not? Yeah, They're definitely. delicious. Oh, snap. They really are. Finally, uh, Ro Alexandra Robbins has uh, created a report called Geeks Shall Inherit the Earth, uh -huh. uh, in which Robbins followed seven self-described outsiders at public and private high school for a year and concluded that what makes kids popular, conformity, aggression, visibility, and influence, won't make them happy or successful after they graduate. I am going to yep. go ahead and say... She rocks. So the popular kids are all going to end up in trailers as drunks and unhappy 
and the nerds and the outcasts all end up as rich CEOs of companies. And so if you're currently a nerd or an outcast, it, it gets better. It does. You get, just got to wait. Does. It gets better. And as I said before, I'm pretty sure her research uh, is strictly watching the social network. <laughs> she says she followed seven kids. The seven kids were the seven characters from so the social network. That's right. She watched it over and over again. But you know, all kidding aside, I think there's some truth to this. I mean, some pe some when you're younger, sometimes being creative and different can mean That's that right. you're not in the in crowd, and it goes uh, to serve you very well later in life. I mean, I think many of our contemporaries. I'm calling us all nerds. To be on a serious I call note, I think myself she's one, like, as much as. The rest of you. <laughs> I agree. But it's a you good know, thing. there's a certain independence, and she, she references Lady Gaga, which, you know, automatically made this story great. Um, <laughs> so, or this writer did of the story we're looking at. Sorry, not the actual person. Anytime who did the you study. can uh, reference Lady Gaga, it's going to exactly. help. Exactly. Great help story. Your case. And, uh, yeah. you know, we were born this way. Yeah, that's exactly what she's, she's talking about here. Yeah. Lady Gaga was way, a freak, apparently, in high school. And we will and, soon rule over all of you. All right. Uh, real quick, uh, thanks to our, uh, our other sponsor for today's show, Trimtronic. It's a natural appetite suppressant. Doesn't use any caffeine. Doesn't use any artificial flavors. Uh, and it takes the edge off of being hungry. If you want to try it out, go to Trimtonic. That's T-O-N-I-Q dot com uh, for more information. And you can even get a 20% discount when you enter the coupon code TWIT. On to the calendar. Okay, calendar items. Motorola Zoom Wi-Fi is going to get Android 3.1, an update, within the next several weeks is what they're saying. Several meaning, what, four? Four to Probably 52. Never. A few is three. Several is four or more, I believe. So, yeah, probably never, Joanna. You're, well, I Joanna, am very you, frustrated. You're feeling over here. rather burned, aren't you? You guys want to take a look at what I've been doing over here? Yes. Here, let me flip this around is the that right the way. Juju pad? Or is that it, This is the juju, yeah. <laughs> this is my the Zoom. It's actually still the review unit I have because I test the, the honeycomb apps on it. And I have been waiting for the update since yesterday. And I literally, probably every two hours or hour, manually try and refresh to see if I've gotten the update. And I have not gotten it yet. And this is the 3G version. And uh, apparently we've heard from a reader. I think this is your next point you're going to get into is that even some people with the Wi-Fi version have gotten it. Yeah, uh, I Joanne, I think. still sit here with nothing. I think Jerome from Brooklyn, New York is, is going to grind your gears further because uh, he wrote in to say, yesterday you guys spoke about the Google announcements, which they mentioned that the Honeycomb update will be rolled out to Verizon Motorola Zooms. I'm very excited to say this is not the case. I have the Wi-Fi only version. As I was about to leave the house yesterday around 8.30 p.m., I pick up my Zoom. I saw an update waiting for me to download, and it was version 3.1, which brought few changes and improvements. Besides, what what was the mention in the announcement there seemed to be fixing some bugs, the YouTube app. Now, he's going on to, to explain what the yeah, improvements are. The improvements but are. the short story is... That's very nice. Some folks got the update. I keep equating it to that scene in Mallrats where the guy's standing to look at the magic eye art and, you know, he's, like, trying to find it. And every time someone comes up and they're like, oh, I got it on the first try. <laughs> and so, like, everyone gets their Zooms and they just try and update it and they get it. And I'm sitting here trying to... Jerome in Brooklyn's like, I don't even have a Verizon one and I got it. And you're like, yeah. screw yeah, you, so, Jerome. Yeah. Cool, Jerome. Just cool your jets, man. And finally, the Department of Justice oversight of Microsoft ends tomorrow. That's May 12th. All right. On to the email to TNT at twit.tv. And our first one comes from a father of a 10-year-old Facebook user. We mentioned uh, that Consumer Reports story yesterday. Wayne in Montreal says... I've got, I'm a father of a 10-year-old boy who's on Facebook, and I can say I have no problem with it. If Facebook was smart, they would embrace their future power users. First off, I sat down with them and explained the Internet security when it comes to Facebook. I've made sure that all of his settings are as private as possible. I've even gone over with his friends when they come over, since most of his friends' parents don't listen to TNT. Secondly, I monitor his Facebook traffic, making sure he knows who he is accepting friend requests from and ensuring there's no crap going on like bullying. And some people disagree with the fact, but I also have his Gmail account added to my iPhone so I can monitor his email. I think of it like a learner's permit. Once he learns to drive the superhighway, I'll stop monitoring. But until then, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Why do I let him use it? It's the best way for him to share photos and videos with his friends and family across the country. He also has some friends on his moguls race team. He does moguls. That's pretty awesome. Uh, that he doesn't see for six months of the year. Facebook lets them stay in touch. Like I said, Facebook should be embracing these underage users since in a few years they will be their main users. Yeah, I think, yeah. I mean, kids under 10, 
I mean, it, there's still a part of me who's like, wow, I can't imagine being nine years old and having a Gmail account. I mean, it just, it's something that parents have to deal with that they didn't used to have to deal with. That said, there's also a part of me who thinks, boy, if my parents were opening letters that, you know, my friends on the ski team were sending me in the summer months when we didn't see each other and reading them, that would somehow take something away from the friendships I'm having with other young kids at that age yeah. because it's not always going to be a bad thing. It's like kids are forming relationships that don't have anything to do with the parents and it's not like a three-way conversation. Where doesn't, I, you know, I think it's a complicated issue. It's going to create a no, whole I bunch totally of- agree. Is he also checking his chats? I mean, nine years old is like sort of the typical age for IMing, right? Or is that... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't right? know what I else mean, he's monitoring, but, you know, I think... I think way, like by, at 10 years old, I was definitely on, like, AOL by that point, you know, chatting. I don't think I was being monitored. I don't know. Tom and I feel really well, I'm, old right now. I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm, at 10 I'm, years old, I was I was definitely wishing my dad would buy a modem for my Commodore 64 so I could get on CompuServe. <laughs> See? <laughs> um, did, was he going to monitor what you were doing there? Oh, yeah. Are you kidding me? Totally would have. Uh, well, in fact, over your in fact like, he didn't buy it so cool. for me. It was basically what he did. At yeah, 10 years old, though, they, these guys are probably writing a secret code by this point, or he's the only 10-year-old with a disclaimer. My dad might be reading this, so be careful what you say. You know, I, I but I think Wayne is doing the right thing here. I, you know, as, as, as you're giving him a hard time for monitoring his 10-year-old, but it's a 10-year-old, right? And so, I mean, the, the Internet is a different thing than letters. Anybody can send mm -hmm. uh, stuff. There's all kinds of viruses you can get in trouble with. I think Wayne is being a responsible parent deserves kudos for that. Uh, the, the the problem with Facebook is that not every parent is going to be responsible and Facebook doesn't want to be liable for that, which is why they've said, look, nobody right. under 13 allowed on Facebook. That just makes it easy for us. But you know what? Uh, Wayne is violating the terms of, terms of service in a good cause here, trying to teach his child responsibility. So I think he has a really good point. Yeah, absolutely. Next email comes from... Who does it come from? Aubrey. No, comes from Jamie. That's oh, Aubrey's you. Hey, TNT crew, this isn't in response to any particular story, but more in response to the almost daily stories about one or the other cloud services that seem to be the latest trend. Amazon's cloud drive, Google's announcement yesterday of music beta, the rumored upcoming announcement from Apple of their iCloud. And then, while not really a cloud service, you have Netflix, you have Hulu, YouTube, Audio, Pandora, et cetera, et cetera, Twit.tv, all pushing streaming video and audio. And at the same time, we have all the ISPs pushing back with data limits and bandwidth caps. How will these two conflicting items ever resolve themselves? Well, you know, that's a that's a million dollar question, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Maybe that's what they're banking on. The, the telecoms are so like, hey, you know what? You're streaming everything. We could make money on this. Well, and that, well and that, that's why they need uh, competition so that we can have an ISP that says, look, you know what? We're going to let you stream as much as you want and take take advantage of all of these services. Well, on the serious side, well, hopefully this will mean better compression for video, better compression for audio. So you can actually go on, stay under your caps and mm -hmm. still have higher quality stuff. Because, I mean, even MPEG-4 is, is much smaller than MP, uh, MPEG-2. And our last email from... I think it's Aubrey. Yes. <laughs> but uh, my cell won't go. There we go. Last week on Twit, you guys had the story about AT&T charging uh, overages. I work for an ISP. I work with the legacy access account, including DSL. We resell it through AT&T. The real reason for the data caps, AT&T oversold their ATM DSL products, and customers have been complaining about varying speeds and latency during peak hours on specific CO and RT locations. CO was command center and RT was... It's a central office. A central office. And, and RT is remote terminal. <laughs> Thank you. Or retweet. <laughs> or retweet. It or is command center also, as far as I know, West Coast. <laughs> to fix the speed issues, AT&T needs time. They need to obtain and install red back routers and those oversaturated CO RTs. Uh, you won't find that in the news because they have not announced it publicly. I have been hearing it from their text for the last couple of months. I hope this helps. By the way, I love Twit. Thanks for making my commute informa inform informational, and I can't speak. Uh, so thanks for that, Aubrey. Really interesting stuff. Essentially, the ISPs have been dragging their heels on upgrading their equipment and now want to pass along the savings to you. It's always nice to hear uh, from someone on the inside who's like, here's what's really going on. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, which is why we like to have Joanna on, because uh, she always has the inside scoop on stuff. Thanks again for being on Tech Sometimes. News today. Thanks, Joanna. Yeah, Got to see this Aubrey person if I can get on the scoop list. Yeah, but, Yes, thank you guys for having me. Great always to be on and uh, keep up the good work. But 
hope to get some other Google uh, non Google news into the mix I for think the rest maybe, of the week. So I'll be tuning in. Yeah, I think maybe tomorrow uh, we'll be able to escape from the uh, the Google cloud, a cloud yes. of Google news. Uh, let folks know what's going on at This Is My Next and what you're doing over there. So yeah, This Is My Next is the new home of some X and Gadget editors. We've uh, sort of put up an interim site. We're building something new. It will be out hopefully in the fall. That is our target date. Uh, but now we are publishing news and editorials and uh, reviews, some cool reviews in the pipeline um, on thisismynext.com. So you guys should check it out there. And uh, tomorrow I have a review I've been working on for a few days now, so I'm excited about that going up. Excellent. Honeycomb tablet. Always great yep. to have you on the show. Thanks, everybody, for uh, watching or listening, however you consumed it. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. Email us, TNT at twit.tv. And give us a call. Leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. That's the phone number. We'll talk to you next time. I never really did learn how to do the sprinkler.